What's going on guys, Waco from Revolution. Welcome to my apartment and I'm, I'm here with two guys that uh, have done a pretty incredible job in the watch industry and the watch community building uh, and kind of on parallel tracks, right? Like I think the rise of uh, Chepec and the rise of Collective have kind of paralleled each other. So I have Xavier de Roque-Moret, who is the owner and boss of uh, Chepec and chief designer and you know, uh, muse to himself. <laughs> and, and Asher, who is one of the co-founders of Collective over with Gabe who's over there but he doesn't want to hang with us, I don't know what's going on, no. And, and he's apparently not wearing a suit to the Horological Society of New York uh, dinner either, but, but so we'll, we're all gonna wait to see the paparazzi photos and see what he wears, I think it'll be cool. How are you guys? It's awesome, awesome to see you, man. Thanks for having us over to your apartment. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Xavier, como se va mon ami? Great pleasure to uh, be here. Yes, I only discovered that you uh, spent a semester in, uh, in, in, in America, yeah. in college. Amazing uh, time. What, what, where, what part of uh, the United States were you in? It was Illinois. Okay. And I were in, it was in the middle of nowhere. Right. It's called Normal. So, it, so. It, it's actually called Normal. Yes, right. really. Okay. And, and, and as a dude with a really suave French accent, did you yeah. do well in Normal? Yeah, 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 it was okay actually. Yeah, I learned a lot of things. It was great. It was a very special place because it's cold in the winter. Right. And if you uh, stand on a chair, you see the back of your head. And that's the that's the legend that they say there. Amazing. So it's very, very flat. Okay. But a great atmosphere and a good way to discover the campus life. Fantastic. In the US, which is, I think, unique. Uh, yes, uh, involves a lot of beer. Um, <laughs> Asher, I gotta ask you the superhero origin story of Collective. Tell us how it was created, sir. Yeah, totally. So, uh, I've known Gabe since I was 12 years old. And uh, through the entire time that we've known each other, we have been um, obsessed with various different things, starting with jam bands um, as we grew up, and then from music, moving eventually into, into other areas like watches. And that's been the thing that kept us friends over the last 25 years um, and ultimately ended up turning into a business. When we were working together uh, years ago at another company, uh, we were part of a group of collectors that were at this company and uh, we were given an opportunity that uh, at the time and still today was pretty awesome where someone approached us and said, hey, would you, would you guys ever want to do a watch uh, for this group? Nice. Like, you, you can do that? We didn't know. <laughs> and uh, Gabe, who comes from a creative direction background, and I am a marketer, sat down, we approached that from that perspective of, you know, I'm not a watchmaker, but I, I see the potential of the canvas here. So what can we do? What's the story we want to tell? So we made the first watch and made 70 of them and they were gone. Like, oh, that's... Which watch was that? So this was a watch that we made um, for a company we were working for with Tudor. Okay. And uh, after that, uh, we made another one with Nomos. And after that, we made another one with Seiko. And we were like, all right, I feel like there's something here. So we came up with the idea of collective and the idea there was to take community and to take collaboration, have collaboration be the glue that held a community together. And we started uh, going out there and pitching and the reality was, uh, you know, we, we didn't know what we didn't know and uh, ignorance is bliss. So sometimes when you go out and you start asking, you, you get lucky and uh, the first brand to really believe in us was Zenith and that set us off on a path. And since then, we've, uh, we've made uh, now seven collaborations, the seventh being this watch that we've done with Chatback. And may I ask, you know, like, what was your discovery process for Chatback? And how did you meet this wonderful gentleman here? So the first time that I handled a Chatback was actually in New York City at uh, Cellini. And uh, I instantly fell in love. I, I held a, a rhubarb uh, Kita uh, Burge, and um, I, I had never seen that color dial come to life in that way. And it just, it, it just blew my mind. And the transparency of the company uh, also really impressed me. Because you know, in the watch world, um, suppliers are often, often hidden. Um, you know, the idea of what is in-house and what is not is, is often mixed, but that was not the case here. You know, we, had a, uh, we had an incredible manufacturer that was saying, this is who we work with. We're proud of who we work with. Look at this amazing product we're making. And it, it was really a revelation. So um, the brand really stuck in my head and uh, after our work with Moser, which was our second collaboration, our third actually, we were like, you know, it would be amazing if we had the opportunity to work with Chapek because in the United States, some of the same folks that worked on Moser at the time uh, from a distribution standpoint also worked on Chapek. And the conversation started from there. And this was, I believe this was 2020, so it's uh, several years ago. And that led us to uh, the creative process that brought us to the watch that we made. You know, how does it make you feel when someone picks up your watch and it feels immediately connected to it? Like, not just from an aesthetic perspective, not just from a mechanical perspective, but from a philosophical and ethical perspective in terms of how you want to communicate your brand and the underlying principle of transparency. 
I mean, we, we are so transparent that we didn't invent the transparency concept. <laughs> That's important to say. So Max before us did that. And right. even Chronosuisse actually is probably the one, first one I found having this approach. Uh, but we do like that and there is a benefit to it, which is that this makes that our watches are not our watches. They are the watches of all the people collaborating around the project. And some of the ideas are coming, you know, when people ask me about the creative process in Chapek, I speak always about a bouncing ball inside a closed room. So I'm the first one throwing the ball, right. and then everyone can touch it, rebounce it uh, everywhere without trying to break things. But, and the process is so creative and iterative that it goes on and on until we get something that we like, oh, it's so fantastic, <laughs> then we can stop. Okay, yeah, so. I, I really enjoyed coming to your, well, I guess that's now your ex-atelier, mm -hmm. and going upstairs and hanging out with Jean-François Mojean as well, and having that collaborative process, and you guys were talking about the split-second mechanism at the time, and to see how the ideas are exchanged is, is super fun. You know, it's almost like being in a creative think tank, and, uh, and, uh, and I love that. But let's talk about the Antarctique specifically. Like, that watch has captured the zeitgeist and the collective consciousness, collective uh, uh, of the world. Like mm. you've got an insane waiting list for this watch now. But for you, talk to me about the creation process of that, and actually tell me about the first time you set eyes on that and why you decided to use that as the basis. So maybe Zavi, you can get you so, go first. Yeah. As you know, we are crowdfunded, but crowdfunded in terms of equity, and that means that uh, I'm an owner, as you said, but I'm one among 200, and these uh, individuals became, without us trying to, a community with a lot of collaboration in it. And, uh, and they gave us some edge on the market and on what should be the next watch we should make for people collecting watches. Okay? So, to have uh, one step, you know, to be one step further, faster. And we involve them into the creative process. And at one point, and we listen. We listen, we listen, we listen. But listening does not mean necessarily following. There is a question, I would say the key word is flair. Okay. And uh, so some of the guys were telling me, you know, Xavier, I love the Kedeberg, okay? But come on, I cannot go on the beach with my kids with a Kedeberg. I sure. cannot have a beer with my buddies. True, true word, huh? Patrick Berger, the, the, the football player, is, he's uh, one of our shareholders. And he said, Xavier, come on, I cannot have a beer with my buddies right. at a barbecue, <laughs> you know, uh, with a Kedeberg. You need to make me a watch that is a little more cool and, uh, and relaxed, even that I could throw in a bag, you know, for yeah, the gym. So we said, okay, we need to go in that direction. And at that point, one of them told us, you know, there's really something missing. This is a true autorologerie watch, and with all the finishes that people would dream of, so anglage, everything that would be speaking about autorologerie, but at the same time that would be strong, sturdy, that would be really a sport watch. And that's why we took gem silver, my show in French, instead of brass, for example, for the bridges. Right. Because we could make skeletonized brass, uh, bridges very thin and have more resistance because the gem and silver is slightly more resistant than brass. Right. Okay, so the whole process was integrating all these elements. And then at one point we, come, we came with two designs. One was an integrated watch and one was a watch with, with lugs. And they all said, the advisory board, so 20 guys who are shareholders at, right. at us, which is a different board than the, than the board. And they said, yeah, you're right. You should do the Lux watch. Okay. All of them. Right. And I understood that. They were saying that to avoid me to fail. But you know, this is high-end watches. This is fine watches. There is no interest of doing that if you don't take risks, if you don't try to break your own limits. And everybody was saying, you know, you cannot do a watch that is better than one of the trilogy. Right. Okay, there is no way. That's the, no, it's too clear. It's too, they are all so different from each other. How come you can come up with a, with a fourth option? Right. And that's when we started reworking and reworking and reworking at night, you know. Sometimes Adrian and I, we call each other from our beds. It's like, <laughs> you know, like, oh, I got that idea, etc. So completely crazy. When that, we don't give up until the watch is ready. Right. And that's how the Antarctic was born. And Asha, for you, when was the first time that you set eyes on an Antarctic? Actually, when was the first time you put one on your wrist? And, and what was the emotion it gave to you? Uh, it, was, <clears throat> it was fairly soon after it was announced. And um, I mean, let, let, let's be honest, you know, the, the, the high-end sports watch category is a crowded category. 
And a lot of it is really derivative, frankly. You know, the thing that really blew my mind about the platform in general was from the get-go, the way that the watch was introduced, there were such a variety of dials that it made it very clear that the platform had a lot of flexibility and a lot to say. It didn't look like anything I'd seen before. And yes, it was an integrated stainless steel sports watch, sure. Right. But you see so many watches all the time, and I'm sure sometimes you see this and you're like, huh, hmm, this, uh, I've seen this before, you know? <laughs> yeah. And none of the tropes that I'm used to seeing in stainless steel sports watches existed here. So there was this mixture of, you know, a really wide vocabulary of, of what could come to life creatively on the dial and a really distinct perspective from the architecture of the actual watch kind of just clicked for me. Like, this is, this is really, really interesting. You know, normally when we build a, a project with Collective, we don't select the watch. We, we choose a, we'll choose a maker and we'll speak to them, we'll work through a creative process and the platform will come out of that. So whatever the creative brief yields will, will lead us to whatever watch we're gonna make. This was unusual because we were like, well, we, we want to do an Antarctique. Now, this was three years ago, you know, right before um, the Antarctique really blew up. And um, we, you know, we're very lucky that you still let us do it as, the, as the, uh, uh, the excitement around the platform grew. But what it also allowed us to do was push a little bit of the limits and, and mix uh, a bit of traditional watchmaking, which is what this dial really represents in a unique way, with really quite modern point of view on a sports watch. And those two things shouldn't really work, but they do here. And that's because <laughs> of the flexibility of the platform. Right. So that's how we ended up there. You, you know, uh, I love the Antarctic and I love it because and I'm not, I, I collect a fairly large variety of watches and you were mentioning that the, the Holy Trinity or uh, so, okay, we, we should talk about the Royal Oak and the Nautilus and the Overseas, right? And what I love about the Antarctic is it's courageously modern at the same time. And I think that's in particular expressed by the fact, so if you look at the Nautilus, the Overseas, um, and, and the uh, uh, Royal Oak, like all three of those watches, at least in their original configurations, were using the same movement, right? So it's, it's a Jaeger design movement, which is the 2121 and, and uh, 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 AP speak. But when you, and, and it feels like a vintage watch as a, re, as a result of that, right? I mean, it's a great watch, but don't get me wrong. When I picked up an Antarctique for the first time and I looked at it and I turned it over, I was like, holy shit. This is one of the most extraordinary looking movements I've ever seen in my life. And the fact that it was created specific to this integrated bracelet sports watch was insane. I mean, that use of like those extraordinary, uh, slightly erotic bridges, you know, it was incredible. The uh, inclusion of the micro rotor, the architecture of that movement, it was insanely beautiful. And I thought that that was what I loved about it was it was, uh, you know, whoever made this was courageously moving the story forward. It wasn't just resting on, on references to the past. And I thought that's, that's really why I feel you're, you're correct. It really is a fourth option. Like it is a watch that exists and deserves to be in place in that same category because it has moved the story forward so much, you know? So, but it was not our objective. Right. I mean, we just wanted to make a nice watch. <laughs> it's, it's phenomenal. <laughs> and that's it, you know, we didn't want it to be there or there. Or there. No, yeah, yeah. just the, no, we I, follow our, our track, we follow our path. Uh, with the same idea, which is we want to make as many as possible people discover the beauty of auto horlogerie yeah. and the soul that watches that have had so much craftsmanship can, can get in the end and can give to the, to the owner. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Asher, I have been following the collector for a while. As you know, I, I work a little bit in collaborations also, but I, I like the, the meaningfulness of your co collaborations, right? Like I feel as if your collaborations work in particular because you're trying to encourage or extract some dimension of the brand that exists there, but the brand may not have necessarily seen it themselves. And, and I think that that's really cool. Um, talk to me a little bit about the design process or the inspiration process for the watch we're gonna unveil today. Sure. So uh, the way that we look at collaboration is, uh, and I think I mentioned this earlier, is to really leverage um, watches as a canvas for storytelling. You know, I, as somebody who, who is madly in love with, completely obsessed with them, one of the things that I find really remarkable about them, you, know, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, the, the beauty and the, the lyricism of uh, this movement. Yeah. You know, watches can really trigger an emotional reaction in a really beautiful way. And they can tell amazing romantic stories. So the way that we approach the uh, collaborative process is uh, not by designing a watch. I am not a watch designer. I'll never be a watch designer. Um, but I went to school for storytelling and it's something that matters to me. So the way that we approach it is by looking for creative territories. 
you know, areas that, that can be explored by the design teams that know the language of that watch brand and bring something to life. And for this project in particular, uh, the territory that we wanted to explore um, actually relates closer to, to a little bit more of Gabe's history. Gabe spent some time um, in Hawaii when he was in college and uh, you know, still to this day, vacations there a lot. It really means a lot to him. And uh, one of the things about Hawaii that of course instantly pops into anyone's head is the ocean, the beach, you know, the quality of water there. And if you've ever uh, been to Hawaii, you know, you, you walk into the water and it's this amazing, you know, crystal clear, you know, sort of just blue, shimmering, you know, perfect, magical beach that I hope that you probably in your head are like, oh man, I want to go yeah. there right now. And we wanted that feeling like, well, how do we, how do we bring that to life? Yes. And uh, we handed that over. We got back some incredible renders. I remember seeing them the first time I was like, this is really cool, but, <laughs> but like, how, how is this gonna work? Like, how is this not gonna, you know, the, on the render, it was, mm, this is interesting. You know, and, and the team was like, oh, don't worry, we have an idea. <laughs> which led us on basically a two year journey um, wow. of unrelenting trying and trying again to really bring to life what we have here, which is, um, you know, and, and I, I know this, this might sound a little hyperbolic, but a watch that I've never really seen before with an effect that I've also never really seen before brought to life through old school watchmaking and traditional methods. So we have the story, we have this incredible craftsmanship and combining that with an ultra modern sports watch really creates something honestly really cool. That's fantastic. You know, I, I actually agree with Gabe. Uh, I, I love Hawaii as well. And there's a moment where you get off the plane and you feel the, the there's like a, a moisture in the air on your skin and there's this Hawaii smell mm -hmm. and you feel instantly like like all your uh, you know anxiety sort of just washing away, which I love. Um, Zavi, and don't forget also the people and the meeting and the connection, right. because this speech was exactly what we were looking at. Right. Because we are often, you know, asked, you know, would you do a, a limited edition? Uh, but a lot of people are sometimes missing creativity, right. and they just think that changing a color is enough to pretend doing a limited edition. And that's not what we were looking at. And actually, they have exactly made what we were looking at, which is we wanted them to do something absolutely unique. And we were looking with Claude Eric at new ways to do uh, enamel. Oh, wow. And we both, you know, we were in this friendly battle with Claude Eric of me bringing completely crazy ideas, him trying not to fall from his chair, <laughs> and then trying to, re, to retarget me in another direction. And uh, Adrian made the design, wow. and we look at it and we started imagining how we could do it. And the process was much more complex than we thought. <laughs> but as you say, you no. Know, Innocence is a bliss or something like that? Ignorance. <laughs> Igno ignorance is a bliss. I never said anything about innocence. <laughs> exactly. This is, this is a nice summary of it. I mean, right. We're not ignorant of uh, enamel making. Right. And it's traditional enamel making. But what we were ignorant is how to recreate the depth of the water of the Lanikai beach in a watch. And that was the bridge. That was the pitch. But Xavier, what is the underlying technique for this? Because I, I also haven't seen this this uh, this enamel treated in this way as well. Right? I mean, it's it's quite surprising to me, and it's I mean, I'm, I'm deeply intrigued by it. But what's going on here? How did you how did you accomplish this? So, the the first step was to create actually a main plate in gold, right? And ask uh, Michel, uh, our engraver, since the beginning. And it's very funny because Michel lives in the next house to where Claude Eric works in uh, Dans et Cadrons. And uh, she has been doing incredible engravings in platinum and, and in gold for us and, and for other famous independents. And, uh, and we ask her, you know, to start working, you know, with creating an effect of depth, which we never could achieve the way we imagined. So we finished with a pla flat effect, but with really the waves, well, the waves, the dunes that you see in the bottom of the water when you swim in, a, in Lanikai Beach or in other beautiful beaches like that. And, uh, and in, uh, the second thing was then the color. To find the enamel mix, oh. which the enamel mix, you have to imagine that you have a, some blocks of stone, or in fact, they are, they are blocks of glass, because they have been prepared, mixed, colored, and then rebroken, and that's what you receive, okay? Then you melt it, and during the melting process, you can have some good or some bad reactions. And we had the first batch, 
with terrible reactions. So it was not something that was possible. So we need to restart because Clodéric had uh, scouted the world to find that powder to make that color because we were very clear on the color. And he finally found again another batch, another, another little uh, box of uh, powder that could, uh, powder, little pieces of stuff of glass that could be melted to make this unique color. The color is stunning, right? And, and what I like about it, like, I, you know, uh, Xavi and I have a lot of conversations about wine because we like wine, right? <laughs> and, and like for me, uh, an amazing wine is a wine that expresses a, a dynamic contrast, right? So fruit and acidity, the tension between them creates like length. And, and what I love about this watch is you have this really interesting dynamic tension between the dial and the movement. Like the movement is extremely contemporary, but beautifully finished. And then you have this extraordinary kind of crap based tranquility of the dial, which like you look at it and it's kind of funny, like you actually get that kind of emotional value that you get when you step off that plane in Hawaii where you're like, I feel relaxed, I feel calm. Like I love the fact that you haven't put indexes on here at all. We initially, yeah. in the first design, there was indexes. Right. And then we, we got the final dial, you know, with all these uh, dune effects made hand by hand, you know, right. line by line by, by Michel, and that we could see them moving as if, as if when you're in the water, you see them moving, you know just by doing an, giving an inclination to the watch, yeah. we thought, no, we have to leave that pure yes. and get the, the amateur to dive into the watch. Right. The other thing I like about it is it's a watch that is, expresses like the values of both of you guys, which I, you know, I admire a lot, right? You know, it's funny because uh, I was just in the Maldives with another brand mm -hmm. and uh, I was talking to this guy, my friend Wen, who is one of the managing partners of Kleiner Perkins, right? And it was an incredible moment because it was during the, like explosion of Silicon Valley Bank, right? And and he was talking about how how people will remember you when you how you act, not when times are good, but how when times are bad, right? Mm -hmm. And that's really like that they will remember that. And and he said something I'll never forget. He said, you know, way there's two types of people in life. There's people who are coin operated, and there's people who are mission driven. There's mercenaries and there's missionaries, right? Mm -hmm. And he said the irony is the guys that are coin driven, the mercenaries, never really end up making that much coin. And it's the guys who are the missionaries who are like trying to create excellence, right? And who sacrifice so much along the way and who don't take every opportunity and stay on their path that creates something truly great. And I think that that's very true for you. I know it's really true for you, Zavi, and I know what you've been through as well. And I have so much admiration for that. And I know it's really true for you as well, Asher. I know you haven't taken up every opportunity and you're very selective about the projects that you guys do. So I, I love this watch also because it, it expresses the underlying ethics of two amazing guys as well. Zavi, you, you have, uh, uh, I guess, a, a bit of an issue related to how you're gonna allocate or deliver Antarctiques. How are you dealing with that mm -hmm. now? And I know I want to ask you the same question because I know for the number of pieces you're making, which is uh, 50. 50, you're going to have probably 10 times the number of people that want to buy it. But, but Zabi, you tell me first. Well, you know, uh, it's very simple. We keep our word. That's, so we talk to these guys much before the uh, avalanche came over the Antarctic, you know? Right. And, uh, and so we said, yeah, cool. Huh? So we just sped this volume. We knew that we would launch the watch at a moment where suddenly, well, very few people could get access to an Antarctic because of the avalanche, but we said, that's okay. Everybody will understand that these guys actually have been dealing with saying, okay, we want to make 50 watches and it's exactly what, uh, what we want. Please spare us 50 movements, 50 cases, and we will make together the 50 dials. Yes. And that's what's happening. Yeah, but you're, you're not everyone's like you, Xavi. You know, I, and I know from you know, my own perspective, I had situations where something blows up in popularity and they're like, you know what? We're just gonna keep everything for ourselves. So mm -hmm. the fact that you kept your word to Gabe and Asher is extraordinary. Um, from your perspective, I mean, you know, tell me a little bit about like the pathway you're on from Collective and how this watch represents everything that you, you value. We have two lines of watches that, uh, collaborative watches that we do at, at Collective. Um, the C series, the collective watches, which we generally produce in, in larger numbers. Um, and then the P series, um, which really speaks to me, which is almost entirely focused on independent watches. And, um, uh, you know, I went off the deep end on independent watches about a decade ago. And anyone who um, is a lover of independent watches probably understands that. I mean, you take one step, you know, down that hallway and like, it's, it's over. Uh, it's very difficult to look back because it's a mixture of not only the artisanship, but to be, not to be corny, but frankly, the people. You know, uh, there's a very different feeling that you get when you walk into the independent area at the Pell Expo or the AHCI, for example, 
you know, than when you walk into a gigantic, um, you know, essentially trade palace of a larger brand, which is not a knock on larger brands that do amazing work and that we've worked with, but it's a, it's a different feeling. And with independent watches in general, part of what I love and part of what, what this represents to me is, you know, we talk about the popularity of the Antarctique, but the truth is, you know, that for, for readers of Revolution, you know, they probably know what this is, but 99% of the world, no clue. And it's a little bit of a, of, of a hidden secret to, you know, to folks who might look at that and not know what the brand is, not, not even really know what a Hotorology watch is, but just, wow, see it and click. And that to me is a major hook because if we want to continue broadening the tent of collectors and people who are passionate about watches, we, I strongly believe that we have to hook them emotionally not on any other level because if you see something and the aesthetic speaks to you, you know, and, and the curiosity is peaked because you've never seen anything like that, you're, you might lean into watches. And by leaning into watches, you might invest in an independent watch. And by investing in an independent watch, you're going to convince the next young watchmaker that there might be somebody who will buy their crazy invention. And that flywheel is so critically important to me because that ends up becoming a system for supporting the art form that we believe in. So, you know, that's why that represents um, so much to me. I love it. Well, guys, you know, I, I like this watch so much also because it is kind of like the ultimate insider's community symbol, right? It's to, to kind of look at it and you're like, oh, that guy's wearing an Antarctic. I want to go speak to him. But then this dial, which is so vivid and so beautifully crafted, right? And uh, so o wonderfully old school, but also so wonderfully, you know, modern in terms of his expression. You're going to be like, oh, wait, hang on a second. I know what that is. That's the collective version of the Antarctic. And it's like, I want to talk to that guy because he's cool, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, I got, I got someone telling me one day he was walking uh, in the hallway of a, of a plane, you know, in the middle. Yeah. And then he passed by and then suddenly someone grabs his, his arm and says, you're wearing a, you're wearing a chapek. <laughs> and that's actually, that's Mike, actually, the guy who put us in contact. And he said, and he wrote me back, he said, something is happening. Right. I don't know what's happening, but something is happening. Oh, and that was the beginning in 2020 when, or just before, right. when, when we started picking it. And I think this is going to be a big part of that story, the continuity of that story. Gentlemen, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for coming to my apartment uh, on Thanks, the la Wade. last day of the watch fair. Appreciate it. We love that benevolence. Congratulations, the sir. Of thank sharing you. that uh, we can all have. And good luck, my friend. You too. Uh, it's a truly, truly beautiful watch. So for the 50 guys who are lucky enough to get it, dude, that's awesome. And hopefully when I see you, I'll be like, whoa, I know what that is. And that guy's cool. <laughs> Cheers.